Hello there, and welcome to our final video in which we're going to be talking about some large scale patterns in biodiversity in deep time. It's going to be fun. So in our in-person session, I'm going to be asking you to discuss what processes dictate, dictate or control biodiversity. Um, obviously, we can't discuss that because I'm recording a video. So I'm just going to talk about it right now. So if we think about this, if we break um, biodiversity down into the processes that's responsible for it, we could identify that speciation is the source of biodiversity, right? If we care about the number of species there are, the process by which species appear, so speciation, is really a key one to consider. And speciation rates can be impacted by the rates of evolution. They can also be impacted by life histories, such as, for example, dispersal rates, and by ecological considerations, such as niche availability, the fragmentation of the environment in which this um, speciation is occurring, and specialization within a lineage. So there are all of these factors that we can consider when we're thinking about rates of speciation. But we also need to consider extinction in this equation. So the balance between speciation and extinction is the diversification rate. If you have more extinction than you have speciation, actually biodiversity will be dropping because even though new species are um, evolving, uh, more of those are going extinct and therefore the overall number will drop, right? It makes sense. And as we learned in our extinction lecture about the extinction of individual species, there are a great many factors that impact on extinction risk. Um, those include life history traits, for example. As such, understanding biodiversity and its patterns, and then ultimately our impact on it as humans, is quite a challenging thing to do. And I wanted to finish this lecture by essentially just skimming the surface of a, a single example to illustrate how complex these questions can be. And that simple example is a thing called the latitudinal biodiversity gradient. So I ask here, is biodiversity evenly spread across the globe? And the answer is no, um, it's not. The distribution of biodiversity over the land surface of the planet is far from even. So we're talking about um, specifically terrestrial land-based organisms for this example. The tropics typically contain many more species of both plants and animals than an equivalent area in the higher latitudes of our planet. This is a thing called the LBG or the Latitudinal Biodiversity Gradient, the words I've put on the slide here. This image is a modern day example of the LBG. It shows the distribution of extant vertebrate um, species and it shows that there is a higher concentration of, di of diversity in regions around the equator. Those are regions which are closer to the red end of the color spectrum, so especially around here and around here. And those, um, that diversity declines as you move towards the poles of the planet, so either the north or south. And so that's where we're moving towards blues with, on this map here. That's an example, as I've said, that's based on a terrestrial vertebrate species, but it's actually, it's a pattern that we see in many other groups of animals and plants. As another example, the tropical country Panama is only 800 kilometers north of the equator, so it's equatorial, and that is also a close neighbor, sorry, I was going to mention of, um, of Costa Rica. Rica. Um, that has 667 species of breeding birds in it. That's three times the number of breeding birds species that are found in Alaska, despite the much greater area of Alaska. So a, a key question that then people that are interested in one day um, patterns in biodiversity are trying to answer is what controls this distribution? We can make some simple observations to try and understand it. So for example, we can look at what things eat. Tropical diversity among mammals is due to the greater predominance of a fruit eating way of life. And it also reflects a greater number of insectivores, many of which 
eat insects that in turn feed on the fruits of the forest. So it looks like um, the, the uh, diversity of fruits in these equatorial regions may be driving the latitudinal biodiversity gradient. So diet may be an important driver. But that is only one potential explanation of what we're seeing here. And actually, if we look at this over geological time, things become a bit more complicated. Deep time studies indicate that tro a tropical peak of diversity and then a, a poleward decline um, has not been a persistent pattern throughout the Phanerozoic. So that's throughout the last 540 million years, in case you've forgotten. I suppose minus the 65 since the KT. Anyway, let's, let's move onwards. Indeed, it appears that this pattern is restricted to intervals of the Paleozoic and the last 30 million years. This tropical peak might be a characteristic of cold ice house climatic regimes like the one that we're in at the moment, whereas warmer greenhouse regimes tend to display um, temperate diversity peaks or flattened um, gradients in terms of the LBG. My example here shows the latitudinal biodiversity gradient across the Ordovician Silurian boundary. Each line here on this graph on the right shows a sampling mediated diversity. So this is the diversity of organisms that were around at this time corrected by a factor such as the volume of rock that we have to actually sample those fossils for. So we can think of this as a better um, measure of the true diversity of the things that were alive at this time. And it shows this measure of diversity for three paleo continents called Avalonia, Baltica and Laurentia, marked by the A, the B and the L on this map. And what this shows us is that diversity before and after the late Ordovician mass extinction event, this is an event when approximately 85% of marine species went extinct during a transition from a greenhouse to an ice house world, um, shifted at this point. Before the extinction, this biodiversity measure was only slightly higher in the Paleo-Equatorial Laurentia, this continent here, um, than it was in Baltica and Avalonia. And indeed, it was lower for some taxonomic groups. But small differences, such as this shallow latitudinal biodiversity gradient between Laurentia, Baltica and Avalonia, seem to have been magnified by this glaciation. And diversity then declined after the glaciation at higher latitudes, but not lower latitudes. As a result, after the Ordovician Silurian extinction into the Silurian, you see a far more pronounced lat latitudinal biodiversity gradient. It's also interesting, I think, to note that post-extinction diversity recovers far more rapidly in Laurentia than it does elf elsewhere. So that is an interesting observation. And if we compare this with someone sometime in the Mesozoic, so this is a, uh, an example from the Cretaceous, which was a greenhouse period, um, you can see that there is no clear latitudinal biodiversity gradient. There's no evidence at all really for a modern type LBG in global sampling mediated analyses. That's this line on the right on the right hand side here, I'm shown in red. Um, uh, this is actually a, a line showing the diversity of Mesozoic terrestrial dinosaurs, including birds. So this is once more one of those corrected diversity curves. And what we see is that dinosaur diversity actually peaks somewhere at paleotemperate latitude, so between 30 and 60 degrees either side of the equator. And it shows a strong correlation with the distribution of the land area during this time that's uh, shown in this, um, by this black line here. And this suggests that in this greenhouse climate, there was a diminished role for climate during this Mesozoic greenhouse interval. It was characterized, in other words, by a weakened latitudinal climatic gradient and therefore a lower LBG. There is some competing evidence actually that I've, I've linked here 
um, by in a paper by Crane and Lidgard in 1989 um, for some LBG um, patterns in Cretaceous um, angiosperms, that's flowering plants. But those studies on plants don't generally correct for sampling, so um, that could explain the pattern there perhaps. So basically, um, when it comes to this particular time period and this, this pattern, uh, the jury is out. When we're thinking about explanations for this, one really tempting one to, to think about is whether evolution is faster in the tropics. And this is actually a really interesting question. Um, because if the generation of genetic variation or its selection proceeds more rapidly under tropical conditions, uh, this could explain the LBG. It's something, um, this, this potential pattern called the evolutionary speed hypothesis. And this is a hypothesis that suggests that molecular evolutionary rates, so that's the evolution of DNA, may be higher among species when they're inhabiting warmer environments. If so, the richness that we see in terms of the species diversity of the tropics could simply be due to the continual evolution of new forms there. But it turns out the evidence for this is actually variable. I've put two um, sources on this slide which you may want to consider. The first one by Davies et al surveyed um, data relating to the rate of diversification of plant groups in tropical regions and this paper found that molecular evolution was faster in high energy, therefore tropical environments. Of course, it does not then immediately follow that this is the driving force resulting in increased diversity. So remember that correlation does not equal causation. We, uh, we discussed that at length in our extinction lectures. For example, the accumulation of species seems to be faster in regions of high biomass and also higher energy, but that could be the result of either of speciation being more rapid or of course of extinction rates being lower. Thus, it's not necessarily down to speciation rates and it's not necessarily down to increased speed of evolution. So there's lots of things happening here. And indeed, the evidence for the evolutionary speed hypothesis is in fact mixed. So Orton et al, the paper that I've put on this, um, on this slide here, looked at um, a wide range of different animals, animal phyla. They actually took eight th over 8,000 pairs of lineages and compared the evolutionary rates within that lineage at low versus high latitudes. This resulted in the graph that you can see here. This is a graph that shows, la shows latitudinal difference between those two um, parts of the lineage versus the branch length um, between those two lineages. This is uh, essentially um, a graph that means that above this line in the middle here you find faster evolution at lower latitudes. And as you can see there's actually a fairly even split between these data points. Just over half, 51.6% of, um, of, of these um, pairs displayed a higher molecular rate of evolution in the lineage inhabiting latitudes closer to the equator. The remaining 48.4 displayed a higher rate in the higher latitude lineage. And this suggests that even if the um, evolutionary speed hypothesis does exist and impact on um, the evolution of animals, it may not serve as a strong universal mechanism that underlies the latitudinal biodiversity gradient. We're gonna to have to look for other explanations. So at present, there isn't a clear cut answer to whether uh, rates differ across latitudes, or indeed ultimately what causes the LBG. There are loads of hypotheses out there which I've not mentioned because I wanted to keep this video relatively short for you today, but it's a really interesting question to think about. So I hope you've enjoyed this video, I hope you've enjoyed learning about paleobiogeography, and I'll see you next time. Take care!